There is an episode of The West Wing where President Bartlett hosts a chili dinner in the residence of the White House. All of the staff are invited. Everyone is relaxed and enjoying each other's company. The president is in conversation with his chief of staff, Leo McGarry, and with his deputy chief of staff, Josh Lyman. The three of them are scanning the room and talking about these women. The president, Leo, and Josh are in awe of the women with whom they work. We can't get over these women, Leo says. And they begin to reflect on each of them. Press Secretary C.J. Craig, she's like a 50s movie star, so capable, so loving and energetic. Media director Mandy Hampton, look at Mandy over there, they say, going punch for punch with Toby. Toby's the communications director with whom Mandy is engaged in a lively debate. Look at Mandy over there going punch for punch in a world that tells women to sit down and shut up. And then Mrs. Lanningham, the president's executive secretary, did you guys know that she lost two sons in Vietnam? In 14 years, she's not missed a day's work, not one. And they continue, there's Kathy and Donna and Margaret, these women. I couldn't help but recall this scene as I studied and dwelled in our reading from Exodus this week. Like the president, Leo and Josh, we stand in observance and awe of these women. And there are many of them. Let's take another look through our story, another scan, just a quick list. First, there's Shipra and Pua, midwives to the Hebrew women. And then there are the Hebrew women themselves. One of these Hebrew women is Moses' mother. She is unnamed in this story, but we learn later in Exodus that her name is Jochebed. Moses' sister also goes unnamed in this story, but there Miriam is, waiting on the banks of the river, ready to help her brother. And finally, there is another unnamed woman, Pharaoh's own daughter, and also her attendants with her. These women, active players in God's story of redemption. Pharaoh does not know God's story. That's what we're told at the beginning of this reading. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So let's pause a moment to make sure that we know Joseph. We just finished hearing Joseph's story last Sunday from the book of Genesis. Joseph, who was the beloved son of Jacob and Rachel, whose brothers were jealous of their father's affection for him and sold him into slavery in Egypt. Joseph, who then began to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and in doing so, saved the Egyptians from devastating famine and also gained favor in Pharaoh's court. Joseph, who reconciled with his family and lived in Egypt with them, the flourishing of Jacob's family tied to the flourishing of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's people. So by the time of today's story, this Pharaoh does not know Joseph. Not know in the personal sense, too much time has passed for that. Joseph is long since dead. This Pharaoh does not know the story. He does not know the story of the mutual flourishing of his people and Joseph's people. And so Pharaoh begins to operate from fear. He creates a different story, a story that is a threat to his position and power. 
the Israelites must be dominated by Egypt lest they rise up against Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites. He enslaves the family of Joseph, who was once Egypt's very salvation. Pharaoh does not know Joseph, but he's about to know these women. These Hebrew women who keep bearing healthy babies into the world even as they suffer every cruelty and indignity of forced labor. Pharaoh is livid that his story is not succeeding, that the Israelites continue to grow in number even as he writes new chapters of oppression and exploitation. Pharaoh does not know Joseph, but he's about to know Shipra and Pua. Harsher work conditions have not been the answer, and so Pharaoh comes to the midwives with an edict. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if, is it, but if it is a girl, she shall live. And we're told that the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. Shipra and Pua know who Joseph is. They know Joseph's God, and they know God's story. They know the story of God's people, and they are willing to write the story of their lives into God's story. And it turns out Pharaoh is not all too pleased by that. He summons Shipra and Pua and has a question for them. Why, he says, have you done this and allowed the boys to live? Shipra and Pua have prepared well for this moment. They probably knew that at some point Pharaoh would begin to notice. And so they say to him, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. It is an answer that confirms Pharaoh's own prejudice. Those Hebrew women giving birth like the livestock before the midwife even arrives. And so the midwife's answer is acceptable to Pharaoh. He only hears what he wants to hear, and so Shipra and Pua continue to write their stories into God's story. And in doing so, they make a way for Moses and for an entire generation of Israelites who Moses will lead out of Egypt. And we should name here that when Moses leads the people out, There are many translations that describe the people as a mixed multitude. There are Egyptians in the number of the people leaving Egypt and following Moses. A return to that dream, the dream of a dreamer like Joseph, where Pharaoh's people and the Israelites can flourish together. They leave Egypt in a mixed multitude, and Shipra and Pua are just two of what is a community of midwives that support that life-bearing work of God's people. These women, they are the foundation on which God's people will flourish and grow. They know who God is, like Joseph before them, and like Peter, who comes after them. Who do you say that I am? Jesus says today to Peter and the disciples. Jesus' question is direct. It's personal. Different from his first question of who do people say that the Son of Man is? Easier for the disciples to give a report with this question eager responses of John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. 
the disciples could probably have continued, oh, what was it that the Canaanite woman called you? Son of David. And then we could talk about the Pharisees. Jesus, they are saying all sorts of things about who you are. I imagine Jesus smiling, patient, allowing the reports to continue for a time, and then silencing the whirlwind with, but who do you say that I am? Good rabbi and teacher that he is, Jesus does not intend to make the disciples squirm, but he does intend and expect them to think. The disciples have left all that they know to follow Jesus. They have journeyed with him, shared meals and life and laughter. They have heard Jesus preach and teach and seen him heal. And after all this time, Jesus wants to know, who do you say that I am? It's the question, really. The answer to it affects everything. When I say who Jesus is, I am also saying who I am. I am claiming a story, God's story, and offering the story of my life to be transformed. And only the Holy Spirit can predict where that transformation may take us. For these women, for Shipra and Pua, Jochebed, Miriam, and Pharaoh's daughter, it means that they stand in holy defiance against Pharaoh's death dealing. For Joseph, it means that he is inspired by the power of dreams to help not only his family, but also Pharaoh's people to flourish. And Peter, impetuous Peter, goes from rock to stumbling block and back again, from denial in the courtyard to preaching on Pentecost. Peter's confession of who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, is not once and for all. Peter has to keep confessing who Jesus is and keep claiming God's story and keep offering the story of his life to be transformed. Again and again and again. This is the pattern for followers of Jesus. It is the pattern for the community of the church. Keep confessing who Jesus is. Keep claiming God's story and keep offering the story of our life to be transformed. Again and again and again. And we do not do it alone. Every time we renew our baptismal vows, we are reminded that we only do it with God's help. When we forget or when we grasp too tightly to our own storytelling or when our minds are too conformed to this world, Jesus is there, patient, yet insistent, with a question for us. But who do you say that I am?